the talk on model epistemology, which is about how you can come to know that something is possible or that something is necessary, but the possibility and necessity at issue are the absolute ones, the ones that we now often call metaphysical, especially after Kripke. Okay, so take the totality of possible worlds across which all and only the genuine possibilities are represented, if you're necessary, you hold that all of them. Okay. And the title is a quote from Hume, here's the longer quote, and a very famous passage of the treatise, where Hume says, um, I'm going to read it with a Scottish accent. So, uh, it is an established maxim in metaphysics that whatever the mind clearly conceives includes the idea of possible existence, or in other words, that nothing we imagine is absolutely impossible. Okay, so that's him. And I'm going to focus on a principle stated by Hume here. I would have liked to call it Hume's principle, but you know, the name was already taken. So I'm calling it Hume's other principle, hop. Okay. Nothing we imagine is absolutely impossible. Now, variations of that principle have a big role in modern metaphysics. There's a number of people who say, oh, how do you get evidence that something is possible? Well, you imagine it, or you conceive it in some sense. Um, I'm going to argue that the principle is false, it fails. Uh, I'm not the first one to argue for that. Um, but uh, in this work, uh, which is a co-authored work with Thomas Conan, who's a PhD at the ILC, the Institute for Logical Language and Computation in Amsterdam, uh, we're going to try to provide a new way to refute Hume's other principle. Um, and we're not going to focus so much on the notion of possibility, one of the, of the two notions in play in the principle, uh, because that's reasonably under control after the development of 20th century model logic, possible word semantics, and so on. Uh, all of these notions are very controversial, but we have an understanding of them nowadays. Uh, so in that sense, possibilities are under control. Take the space of all possible worlds to be impossible in the sense which is held to us, is to hold that none of them. It's the other notion which is in place in Hume's principle, which is messy. Conceivability or imagination. So Hume uses the two rather interchangeably, <laughs> conceiving, imagining. You know that other early modern philosophers don't use the notions in the same way, like Descartes. Descartes makes a sharp distinction between conceiving and imagining. He gives the famous example of the Kiliagon. He says you can have the concept of the Kiliagon, but the, the Kiliagon is a, a geometrical figure with a thousand sides. Okay. You can have the concept of that, for instance, because you can prove theorems on that, on that geometrical figure. Uh, without being able to imagine it, where by imagining it means something like having mental imagery. Okay. It would be hard to picture a geometrical figure with a thousand sides all in one go. You'd probably visualize something like a circle. Okay. Hume doesn't have that, that kind of distinction, or he blurs it intentionally. Uh, I will get into this anyway. Uh, conceivability or imagination are messy nowadays as well. They're not under control in the way possibility is. And Tom and I have the thought that uh, we could look at results from mainstream cognitive psychology uh, to make the notion a bit more precise. Uh, so first of all, um, I'm going to focus on uh, propositional imagination, so a situation in which one imagines that P, that Pericus is John, that Obama is the president, that the Nazis have the A-bomb in 1944, in all of these cases, one has a mental representation whose content is that big. So I'm going to assume throughout the talk that there are such things as mental representations, okay, which are about configurations of objects and properties, situations or circumstances that make for their contents. Now, that's, that, that's fairly controversial nowadays in the philosophy of mind and cognition, because there are people like uh, Dan Hutto and others called radical inactivists people who think that you can explain everything in the philosophy of mind and cognition without ever invoking mental representations. Okay, so I'm just going to assume anyway that there are mental representations. And I don't think that the debate on uh, 
assume that the principle makes a lot of sense unless there are such things as mental representation. How do mental representations represent? That's a key question I want to focus on. So let's look at some views in cognitive psychology. Here's a mainstream one. It's due to Alan Paivio, so he's one of the greatest cognitive psychologists of the 20th century. He studied mental representation throughout all his career, and he came up with a book with that title, Mental Representation. And in that book, he starts from a distinction that has to do with physical representation. He says, some physical representations are picture-like, and others are language-like. Picture-like representations include photographs, drawings, maps, and diagrams, Language-like representations include natural human <coughs> languages, as well as such formal systems as mathematics, symbolic logic, and computer languages. And what's the difference between the two kinds of representations of the two kinds of codings for the relevant representations? Well, he says, uh, consensus seems to be developing around the idea that the fundamental distinction dimension is the degree of arbitrariness of the market relation between the form of the representation and the form of the represented world. Thus, the terms picture-like, analog, iconic, and asymmetric all imply that such representations map onto represented objects in an arbitrary way. In the case of language-like representations, on the other hand, the relation is completely arbitrary. Okay? So that doesn't mean that some representations feature a mixture of the two codings, of the two ways of representing. For instance, uh, here's a map of a small town in Scotland, completely dominated by a small university. Um, actually, that is, that's a city in which there are more students than ordinary citizens. Uh, that's where my office is. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so that map represents partly pictorially and partly conventionally. So for instance, the sum of Italianus how the maps are present, understood conventions they take the top, bottom, left and right, stand for north, south, west and east, respectively. Okay. We could have decided that south, south is that way and north is that way. That's conventional. On the other hand, there's also no arbitrary representation secured by relevant similarity. For instance, that the sea is blue and the land is greenish is represented by similarly colored corresponding patches on the map. Or that the castle of St. Andrews has a certain shape is represented by a similar shape of the corresponding figure. Okay. So that representation does its job partly conventionally and partly by relevant similarity to the represented situation. Okay, so uh, there's no such similarity in purely linguistic representation. So I could have described a part of the situation represented by the map by saying, oh, there's a so-and-so shaped castle in the lower part of the city, facing the blue sea. It's conventional that blue stands for the color blue, it could have had on that color yellow. Okay, so, Paivio has a theory of mental representation which is very popular. It's called the dual coding theory of mental representation. Basically, the dual coding theory says there are two codes for mental representation. Some mental representations represent linguistically. Cognitive psychologists call them propositional mental representations often. Uh, and some represents by being uh, mental imagery. Mental imagery is characterized by reference to perception of cognitive psychology. Uh, they talk about cause and perceptual experience. Because it resembles perceptual representation, but it can occur in the absence of the actual stimulus. Okay. And that's a phenomenon that is familiar to most of us. Okay. So we all experience having uh, mental imagery. Actually, the opposite case, the case of aphantasia, is rare. So, uh, the people who claim not to have any kind of mental imagery are the people who are studied by cognitive psychologists. Okay? Because the normal situation is the one of people who claim uh, to have pictorial mental representations. The one which is most studied is visual mental imagery, but it can be in any uh, sensory modality. Like when you hear a tune, in your head, okay. so you hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, even though it's not playing really outside. Okay. Um, okay. Um, 
There's agreement on the fact that mental imagery is available for parallel processing, the famous experiments, perhaps taking back to the 70s and 80s. One can totally represent oneself once in a room, scanning the objects from top to bottom, from left to right, to the corner, and so on. On the other hand, linguistic mental representations are processed serially, the way we process the meanings of sentences through those of their substantial components. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, parenthetical remark. Not everybody agree with the, agrees with the dual coding theory. Some people deny that there really are two codings. They claim that all the representational work is done linguistically. So, General Peterson is perhaps the most famous enemy of mental imagery in cognitive psychology, and Fodor has argued against that. Now, these people don't deny the phenomenology of mental imagery, okay? but they say that's not what does the work of representing things. Whenever we have a mental representation, the work of representing things is done in the coding, of, in the linguistic coding, okay? not in the pictorial coding. Uh, there's a big debate on this also, that also uh, has been Discuss, also, philosophers have been discussing that. Uh, I'm not going to get there, and I'm not, not going to take a stance on this issue uh, for the sake of the argument. Because if mental representations are represented physically, I claim Hume's other principle cannot even get off the ground. So it's easier to refute the principle if mental representations involved in imagining that P only represent. Whereas, if there are reducible in pictorial mental representations, things get more complicated. So, it takes more work to show that Hume's other principle is false if some mental representations which are relevant for Hume's other principle uh, represent in a irreducibly pictorial way. Okay. So, what I'm going to give you is basically an argument by cases. Okay. So, when people talk about imagining that P, the relevant mental representation can be either linguistic or pictorial or a mixture of the linguistic and the pictorial or I don't know what it is. It's a magical representation. Okay. And I'll try to show that Hume's other principle cannot be defended for any uh, case. Okay, so let's start with easier case. Suppose that the conceiving or imagining, which is at work in Hume's other principle, has to do with the having of a purely linguistic mental representation. So when I imagine that P, the kind of imagination which is supposed to give you evidence that P is possible, uh, involves mental representation that only represents linguistically, purely conventional. So for this case, I'm going to ask you to buy the parity assumption. That's how we called it. And the parity assumption says, whatever content can be represented by some sentence in the language, can also be represented by some linguistic mental representation. Now, the parity assumption is obvious if linguistic mental representations just are sentences of some natural language token in the head. So to linguistically represent that P in your mind, just means uh, that you have a sentence in English or Italian or some other native language token in your head. In that case, PA is obvious. But lots of people who talk about linguistic mental representations don't think that they work exactly in that way. Okay? People often invoke a deeper uh, kind of linguistic mental representation. Uh, but even if linguistic mental representations are encoded in some deeper language of thought, that's a most case perhaps for this language of thought, it still is the case that anything that can be represented in the native language should be represented, should be such that you can represent it in mentalese, because the latter by hypothesis grounds the learnability of the former. So people who believe in the language of thought as the code of mental representation say, well, it's because you have the language of thought encoded in your head to begin with that you learn, you can learn, learn learnable languages, native languages like English or Italian or Swahili, and so on. Uh, 
And given that kind of assumption, the conceivability of the impossible by linguistic matter representation is impossible, because there are meaningful sentences of English that describe impossibilities, for instance, of the form P and not P. Uh, just assuming that that cannot possibly be anything, but that, that cannot possibly be true. Okay. If you are trying to play a priest, you, you're not going to be a boy, but I'm not, not going to do that here. Uh, I see only two possible moves to deny this. I see here that English sentences allegedly describing impossibilities are meaningless things. So they have no content. And the other one is to think that although they are, they are meaningful, they have content, and so by the fact assumption, they can have corresponding meaningful linguistic representations. We can't understand them. The second proposal seems strange, given compositionality, composition, for other languages, so that P be a simple meaningful intelligible sentence like this table front. Surely P cannot become an intelligible because we stick a negation in front of it, so not P must be intelligible too. And surely two such sentences cannot deliver an unintelligibility once we can join that P and not P, so the latter must be intelligible too. And by the power of the assumption, we can have corresponding linguistic mental representations whose content is that. But even strategy one seems to be incredible. Maybe Wittgenstein may know that came close to making such a claim. Tautologies, contradictions are zinnos, but even he made the distinction between zinnos and inzinic. That's the big debate between, between the Wittgensteinians on what the distinction amounts to. I'm not going to get there. Um, but here's a <coughs> why makes the point in the most convincing way. This is a quote from On What There Is, so a little bit of context. This is Quine arguing against Wyman, a, fi a, philosopher, a fictional philosopher whose stance is, always, is often identified with Meinung's view. I claim that the identification is wrong, so what Wyman says in, the, in Quine's paper and Meinung's theory are very different. But anyway, uh, so. Weinman says something like, oh, uh, Pegasus must be in some sense, otherwise it would be meaningless to make any claim about Pegasus, including Pegasus does not exist. Okay. Um, and Quine says, oh, well, um, by parity of reasoning, the round square cupola of Berkeley College must be, otherwise you couldn't make meaningful claims about that. But the rounds per cupola of Berkeley College, well, that's inconsistent. So Wyman is committed to an inconsistent view. Uh, and Wyman replied by saying, oh, but inconsistent conditions are meaningless. They have no content. And then Quine makes the checkmate move. He says, what the name? Certainly the doctrine, and it's the doctrine of the meaninglessness of contradictions, has no intrinsic appeal. And it has led its devotees to such exotic extremes as that of challenging the method of proof by the Dutch absurdum, a challenge in which accessory Dutch are absurdum of the doctrine itself. Moreover, the doctrine of meaninglessness of contradictions has the severe methodological drawback that it makes it impossible in principle ever to, to devise an effective test of what is meaningful and what is not. It will be forever impossible for us to devise systematic ways of deciding whether a string of signs made sense, even to us individually, let alone not or not. For it follows from the discovery of mathematical logic in the church that there can be no generally applicable test of contradictoriness. And even Priest, a fan of true contradictions who disagree with, disagrees with Quine nearly, nearly on everything, is on the same page on the meaningfulness of contradictions. Uh, James Priest, quoting him, if contradictions had no content, there'd be nothing to disagree with. And someone after one, which there usually is. Contradictions do, after all, have meaning. If they did not, we couldn't even understand someone asserting a contradiction and so evaluate what they say as false or maybe true. Uh, we might not understand what could have brought the person to search such a thing, but that's a different matter, and the same is equally true of someone who, in broad daylight, asserts that he is for it is night. Okay. 
That's in the case in which uh, imagining that P uh, in place in Hume's other principle involves a purely linguistic uh, mental representation. But debates about, around Hume's other principle often feature a sense of conceiving which may involve mental imagery. Um, and here's where the distinction that some people make between conceiving and imagining, and not just Descartes, but many others, comes into play. Because there are some people who think that imagination properly so called essentially involves the heaven of mental imagery. So that's a very beginning of uh, Tamar Gendler's Stanford Encyclopedia and Your Imagination, where she claims that imagination is also sometimes distinguished from mental states such as conceiving and supposing on the grounds that imagining S requires some sort of quasi-sensory or positive representation of S, whereas the contrasting states do not. Uh, and there are some people like Amy Kind, who wrote the famous paper called Putting the Image Back in Imagination, who think that that's essential okay, for imagining. You need to have pictorial mental representations in your head or mental imagery for your activity to be properly called imagining, as opposed to supposing or other mental states. <coughs> There's a debate on that. We don't need to get into it anyway. Suppose that imagination, uh, which is relevant for Hume's other principle, is essentially pictorial. Now the next question is, does it work purely pictorially? That is to say, without any element of language like arbitrary labeling or mean assignment, but rather purely qualitatively, only by the phenomenological similarity of imagery to the represented situation. Um, remember that even physical pictorial representations don't need to represent purely pictorially. So see the synonymous map. So there are some people who claim that mental representations can never work purely pictorially because representations in general can never work purely pictorially. So only on the basis of similarity with the represented situation. For instance, there are classic objections by Goodman to this view. Goodman opposed the asymmetry of similarity to the asymmetry of the representation relation. So Goodman says, oh, you can't say that a picture of Napoleon represents Napoleon only because it's relevantly similar to Napoleon, because similarity is symmetric. So if the picture of Napoleon is similar enough to Napoleon, then also Napoleon is similar enough to the picture of Napoleon. But you don't want to claim that Napoleon represents the picture of Napoleon. It's the picture of Napoleon that represents Napoleon. So it's, a representation cannot work only by relevant similarity. And also Fodor says pictorial representations are not, not sufficiently specific. You need the pictorial rep representation to come with some linguistic description that fixes uh, what the representation is about. Anyway, there are people who object to the idea that representation in general can work really pictorial. But we learned that some mental imagery uh, that works purely pictorial is possible, and that's essentially involved in that principle. It seems that the only scenarios that you can imagine in this way are those that involve only perceptual qualities, colors, shapes, extension, motion of physical objects. But now this is still restricted to have a, an important role in modal epistemology. Because when philosophers discuss whether the imaginability of intrinsic universals, time travel, a spray beam having all perfections to the highest degree, in taste by a huge other principle of their possibility, the relevant imagination can hardly be purely qualitative. Because it involves abstract objects and other properties quite removed from sensory perception. Thus, in such debates on whether conceivability or imaginability entails possibility, imagination is often understood more broadly than what a purely pictorial characterization of the notion can sustain. Otherwise, we would be dealing with a concept which is still limited to a very significant role in modern epistemology. And people who are optimistic on uh, imaginability giving us evidence of possibility like Yadol, and also people who are more pessimistic on that, like Williamson, agree on this point. So the imaginability at issue cannot be uh, only purely pictorial. Okay, 
So, um, linguistic case, purely pictorial case, that way. Now let's move to the mixed case. Okay. So suppose that the mental representations in play have, are a mixture of the linguistic and the pictorial codings. Now I need to tell you a longer story. And I need to start with the Kripian a posteriori necessities. So there's some people who claim that the Kripian idea that there are a posteriori necessities speaks against Hume's other principle. And you can understand why one would think that way. Okay, so, uh, water is H2O, that's true. Uh, there are only designa rigid designators, flanking the identity signs. So if that's true, that's necessarily true, but that's only knowable in posteriori. We didn't know that before the development of modern chemistry. So doesn't that speak against uh, the entailment from conceivability of imaginability to possibility? Uh, that's what Putnam thought. So that's Putnam from the meaning of me. Putnam says, you can perfectly well imagine having experiences that would convert, convince us and that would make it rational to believe that water isn't H2O. In that sense, it is conceivable that water isn't H2O. It's conceivable, but it isn't logically possible. Conceivability is no proof of logical possibility. Human intuition has no privileged access to metaphysical necessity. Okay. Now, if you read your name in necessity, you know that that's not what Kripke thinks. He has a different view. And in fact, in name in necessity, he comes up with a way of defending Hume's other principle. He has an error theory in the book. He tries to explain situations in which we seem to be able to conceive or imagine some absolute impossibility uh, via an error theory. So what he claims in the book is, when we seem to imagine a situation as that falsifies an a posteriori necessity p, that's what's really going on. A, we actually imagine a qualitatively discernible scenario, S1 different from S. B, such that S1 is possible and thus no falsifier of P. And C, we confuse S1 with S. So we misidentify what we are thinking about. So here's a passage uh, in which Kripke comes up with a proposal, this proposal. It's the famous passage of the lectern, so he was lecturing in front of the lectern. And so he claims, heat is the motion of molecules, will be necessary not contingent, and while he has the illusion of contingency, in the way one could have the illusion of contingency, in thinking that this table might have been made of ice, we might think one could imagine it, but if we try, we can see on reflection that what we are really imagining it's just there have been another lectern in this very position here, which was in fact made of ice. Okay. So the strategy is, oh yeah, you can think you're imagining that water is not H2O, but what you're really imagining is that some odorless, colorless fluid that fills the oceans and the lake blah, blah, is, is not H2O. Okay. And that's a possible scenario. Could be X, Y, Z. Okay. And then you misidentify if that works in general, that protects him as a principle. Okay. But it has to work in general, no cases. And I think that it faces, that the Kripke and Edward theory strategy faces, faces counterexamples. And I also claim that it's based on an objection, objectionable view of imagination. Uh, so, some counterexamples to the Kripke and Edward strategy have been proposed in the literature. Here's one by Christian Wright. Uh, he thinks that first person thoughts can provide counterexamples. So, situations in which you can conceive the impossible, and it's impossible to claim that you are misidentifying what you're thinking about. When I imagine myself in a clearly possible counterfactual situation, such as my being in the Grand Canyon instead of Europe, claims Christian, no more the presentation of the self. Need featuring the exercise before it can count as presenting a scenario in which I am in the Grand Canyon. Okay. And Christian's thought is that you don't identify yourself uh, qua rational thinking subject by modes of presentation. Okay. 
So when it's about pointing at yourself by thinker, there's no mismatch between appearance and, and reality, as there is a mismatch between the phenomenological appearance of water and the chemical structure that makes for the essence of water. Um, so the same holds then, uh, says Kristen, for my, if Kripke is right, how the possible, imagine myself as a monkey, or as being both from different planets, of things which are metaphysical impossibilities, according to Kripke. This is not easily redescribable as my imagined propaganda, which is a monkey and so on, and mistakenly taking the substitute to be me. The idea is that, the idea that Chris Payne pushes is that I do not individuate myself what thinking subject by means of phenomenal surface appearances, as I individuate water by its external appearances of colorless, tasteless liquid. Another case in which the redescription strategy does seem to work. Uh, has to do with mathematical truths or mathematical conjectures, assuming, of course, that mathematical necessity is absolute. So, a competent but skeptic mathematician imagines that she can find some mistake in Andrew Wilde's proof of Feldman's last theory. Okay. And you, uh, there was a bit, bit mistake in the original proof, anyway. Uh, or even direct counterexamples. One may say, oh, that's a case in which uh, there is no method of major at work. When we conceive such scenarios because they involve only mathematical objects, but then we are back to the case of imageless linguistic mental representation. Or maybe that's magical representation by fourth case. I come back to this later. But anyway, uh, the person understands the content of the theory pretty well. It's a simple theorem on diaphragmal equation. It's implausible to redescribe the situation as mathematicians imagine in counter examples to an intentional duplicate of the content of the last last year. No content is identified. Going on here. Okay. I'll take, I don't know, any unproved and refuted conjecture, like Goldbach's conjecture. Okay. Uh, anybody who with uh, elementary school mathematics can understand the content of the conjecture. They can doubt whether it's true, but if it's true, it's necessarily true. Okay. It's impossible to say that anybody who doubts that is not really thinking about that content, but it's misidentifying the contents. Uh, besides, I think that the Pitkin view is based on an objectionable, objectionable view of how imagination works. Um, and I'm going to talk about telescopic versus stipulative views of imagination. Now, the terminology is intentionally Pitkin. Yeah, because you may remember Pitkin uh, arguing against the Eurasian model of realism in naming and necessity and arguing against the, what he called telescopic view of our access to possibilities of possible worlds. Um, the terminology has been used by Peter Kung uh, to make a distinction between two ways in which my, one may think that imagination works. Now, in the telescopic view of imagination, when we imagine a scenario where P, we look with the metaphorical mind's eye at the situation that makes P. So in this view, what cannot happen is that such mental telescope has us look at the impossible. If the scenario shows up, it is there to be seen. So the idea is, just like perception, when it works fine, reveals actuality, so imagination, when it works fine, reveals possibility, because possibilities show up in imagination, in the same way in which reality shows up in perception. Uh, what can happen is that we fail to appreciate what scenario we Again, we can misidentify. So imagine in this view, it's like looking at a photograph. If we see a snapshot of a girl living in Photoshop, it's a side, the girl must exist and have existed, but who's that girl? We can misidentify the girl. Is that Valeria, Laura, somebody else? Now, could be himself obvious against the telescopic view of our access to worlds in the necessity? You know the, the original problem. It's the Kaplan and transport identification problem, not to be confused with the transport identity problem, that's a metaphysical issue. This is a kind of epistemological issue. Uh, which individual in the world W is the transfer pair of an individual in a different world, say the actual world? Given our own David Lewis in the actual world, the problem is to the fact that we are supposed to carry out some investigation among the individuals in that other possible world with the aim of locating the U.S. representative there. 
And I would say, oh, here's one individual in that world whose fingerprints and facial expression are indiscernible from those of our old David, but who never did philosophy and had a career as a drug dealer. And here's another individual who does not quite look like David, but who has written a book called On the Poetic World, where Kent works at Princeton, and so on. Now, which one is Lewis, or the Lewis counterpart there? Crickin famously argued that that's a single problem, because uh, we need them to represent alternative situations in really qualitative terms, in case things haven't found out about the kind of factor situation they're stipulating, and so on and so forth. That's a very famous uh, story. So I'm not going to rehearse that indeed. Now, I think, or we could, that imagination may work more like a quick stipulation than like a quick telescope. When we do deny that imagination in general can have a qualitative or phenomenological component, and that may come with pictorial mental imagery, but if it has a library of stipulation component, that seems enough to defeat Hume's other principle, also in this case. For instance, you imagine Mary kissing John, and that involves some mental imagery. So you imagine two human lookalikes or something like that. The mental imagery can be such that the representative figures are relatively similar to Mary and John, head, color, eyes, bodies, and so on. Uh, but what makes the imagining count as a representation of a scenario in which Mary kisses John is that one takes one figure as representing Mary, and the other as representing John. Just as one can imagine Mary kissing John, then, so can one imagine John as a traveling disguised adult. One labels the person look alike, one is imagining, which turns out on inspection, we are filled with circuits and transistors instead of flesh and blood, and so on. John. Or, if there's a stipulation component in imagination, even when it involves pictorial mental imagery, uh, it seems that you can easily imagine the impossible because you can stipulate the identity of objects via arbitrary labeling. Take qualitatively indiscernible imaginings about different scenarios. So you imagine two monotheistic twins, you know, standing ne next to each other, John on the left, Paul on the right, to the level of detail in which the two are qualitatively indiscernible in the scenario. What makes the one on the left John and the one on the right Paul is that they are so leveled at the level of being inverted, we wouldn't have qualitatively identical imagery representing a different situation, one in which John is standing on the right and Paul is standing on the left. But if the identity of the objects in <coughs> mental representations of this kind is set to that you can easily grant the imaginative situations where the identity of objects is other than what it actually is. You can imagine Muhammad Ali punching Cassius Clay. So, linguistic, pictorial, mix it. Uh, final case, magical representation. So, if the mental representations which are relevant for humans are principle are taken as neither linguistic, nor pictorial, nor mix it, that leaves the humans with a heavy burden of proof. They seem forced to invoke a peculiar third code of representation, one that may have no counterpart in mainstream psychological theory. That's up to humans to provide a plausible account of the relevant imagining. It seems fair to claim that, pending such an account, what is being invoked is some representation of magic. So I don't know how a representation may work if it doesn't work linguistically, <coughs> it doesn't work pictorially, and it doesn't work as a mixture of the two, like the scenario is Okay, that's what I have to say, and that's done. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> 